Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Port. A little bit later in the show, we're going to be talking with North Dakota Insurance Commissioner John Gottfried about... They're taking public comment on what they're calling a reinsurance program. And this is all a little bit complicated, but essentially you, you'll you remember that Obamacare, that national policy travesty that has, well, it's called the Affordable Care Act. Let's just say it's not done a lot to make uh, health care or health insurance very affordable for much of anybody, uh, but it's created a lot of mess at the state level. Anyway, uh, the reinsurance program, it's, a, it's an insurance program that, we are hoping, working within the confines, again, of that very flawed federal policy that should stabilize North Dakota's individual insurance market, make insurance for people in that marketplace more affordable. Now, remember, we're talking about a lot of people who are sort of the backbone of North Dakota's economy. Uh, farmers, ranchers, people in that sort of business, I mean, they're small businesses. And to get their health insurance, a lot of times they're in that individual marketplace which means that they're buying insurance there. So if we can stabilize that market, that's not just good for them. But the insurance commissioner says if we stabilize that marketplace, it should lead to well, less upward pressure on premium increases for the rest of us, even those who might be getting uh, insurance from you know something like an employer or a large group policy, that sort of thing. So stay tuned for that. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about Measure 1 and State Representative Ruth Buffalo from Fargo. Now, I had a story yesterday on SayAnythingBlog.com about Representative Buffalo and a gala, a gala, how do you pronounce that, gala or gala? I don't know. I'll look it up after the show. Anyway, Representative Buffalo attended this event in Tennessee that was put on by a group called Represent.us or Represent Us. Now, this is a left-wing group. Uh, They spent almost $150,000, according to disclosures from the Secretary of State's office, uh, Backing Measure 1, that was the quote-unquote ethics measure that passed on the ballot last year that, frankly, I think has a lot more to do with restricting speech and political activity than it does with ethics or transparency or anything like that. Um, so represent.us, they, they hold this, this rally and it's a star studded event. I mean, Jennifer Lawrence was there. In fact, Jennifer Lawrence handed out an award to Dina Butcher and Ellen Chafee, who are the two women who are sort of the figureheads of uh, you know, the, the left wing movement to pass measure one in North Dakota. Uh, they got an award from Jennifer Lawrence, who is an A-list Hollywood celebrity. Ed Helms from The Office and uh, Hank from you know all sorts of movies and stuff. Super talented, funny guy. He was there. Um, but I mean, it was I mean, this was a very, very left wing event. One of the and I, I spoke with uh, with Chafee and, and Dina Butcher. Excuse me, I, I spoke with Ellen Chafee, who told me on behalf of both herself and Butcher that they paid for their own travel expenses and. You know, they got their award and everything fine with that, whatever. What was interesting to me is that when I was looking at the website for the event, and it was called the Unrig Rally, right? Because they're going to unrig American politics by, well, you know, basically making it harder for everybody to participate in American politics. Um, That was, unless you're, you know, like a rich celebrity who can, you know, or or a deep pocketed interest group or whatever, for for average citizens, it's going to get a lot harder as they get their way to participate in politics. But setting that aside, I noticed on their website that State Representative Ruth Buffalo, who is a Democrat from Fargo, currently in her first term, she's been in office for for mere months, was a quote-unquote featured speaker at the event. Now, now for the life of me, I can't figure out why Representative Buffalo would be a featured speaker at an event like this. A lot of the speakers were very high-profile people, and then you have this random state representative from North Dakota who isn't even all the way through her first legislative session yet. I mean, she has pretty much next to zero, uh, you know, legislative accomplishments. She hasn't really, I mean, I'm not saying that necessarily to to besmirch her character as a criticism. She hasn't had time to do anything yet. And yet, for some reason, she's at this event and she's a featured speaker. I'm not sure I understand. But what's interesting is that Measure 1, as approved by North Dakota voters, makes it illegal for anybody to give any group, any organization hoping to influence policy in the state of North Dakota makes it illegal for them to give a gift to a lawmaker. So I got curious about what sort of compensation or what sort of financial arrangement may have existed between Representative Buffalo and Represent.us, this group which flew her, uh, which I, I, I think flew her to Tennessee for this event. I don't know if they flew her or not, because when I asked Representative the Buffalo and and Representative Buffalo the question, I and I should say I I sent her an email last week. I called her on her cell phone number listed in her legislative biography. She didn't respond to me. Now, that's interesting for a couple of questions. First of all, measure one 
was all about transparency, right? Measure one was all about, you know, stopping, you know, the undue influence of deep pocketed interests on our elected leaders. You know, measure one was all about transparency. I mean, that's that's how it was sold to us. And yet here we have the organization which spent, again, a huge amount of money. I mean, you're talking about almost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars spent. And and I think actually, if you go back and, and you look at the um, if, if you look at the, you know, so, sort of the the organizing, because there's, there's a number of different committees tracking for a group. North Dakotans for Public Integrity is the group that was, you know, so, sort of the local front group for this left wing movement to, to pass Measure One in North Dakota. Uh, they have so many different filings with the Secretary of State's office; it's almost impossible to unwind where their money came from, which is an odd thing for an organization that claims to be promoting transparency. Uh, but, but let's say, at, at the very least, Represent.us spent one hundred and fifty thousand, almost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, to promote. Measure one in the state of North Dakota. They obviously, they spent money. They have an interest in changing North Dakota policy. Now, the North Dakota's Republic Integrity are also backing legislation before the legislature down in Bismarck right now, Senate Bill 2148, introduced by State Senator Tim Mather of Fargo, which would implement Measure One, right? Because Measure One amended the state constitution, but you need statutory language in state law to implement the the new requirements put in the constitution and so now all of a sudden you have a state lawmaker who goes over to attend a star-studded gala right jennifer lawrence ed helms you know all the concerts and everything else i mean it was, it was a pretty luxury event you just go look at their website the unrig rally if you google it i'm sure you'll find it i mean it was a it was a, a posh event we'll put it that way so you have a state lawmaker who is going over to this event paid for by this group. The event was paid for. And she's when asked the question what her financial relationship is with this group, she doesn't answer. Now, that's again, that's an odd situation for a group of people who, you know, are, are, are downright martinets when it comes to promoting transparency and ethics. I mean, if, if you want to have an ethical question you want to promote ethics, maybe just answer the question when somebody asks you, hey, did did they pay for your plane ticket? Did they pay for your meals? Did they pay for your hotel? Did you get anything? Did you get any gifts along the way? Representative Buffalo is not saying. Now, I wrote a post about that because I think when a poli- when you ask a politician a legitimate question and they don't answer you, that becomes a story, right? That's one of the ways you make sure that politicians are accountable to the press is if they don't answer you, that becomes the story because as far as I'm concerned, Politicians should answer questions, right? Reasonable questions, legitimate questions. They have a duty to answer. They have a duty to be responsive to the public, up to and including members of the media, such as myself. So to me, the fact that Representative Buffalo is not answering this question, she is not being transparent about her relationship with this group, which in turn promoted transparency, or at least what they describe as transparency, a transparency amendment to the state constitution. I think that's, well, that's pretty darn interesting. Now, above and beyond this story, though, a lot of the reaction I got from readers was something along the lines of Representative Buffalo has has no cause to to respond to you. You're just going to be critical of her anyway. In fact, one woman on Facebook accused me of harassing Representative Buffalo. Now, that woman eventually apologized for using that sort of language. But that's been sort of the reaction is this idea that somehow by asking the question of Representative Buffalo about what her financial relationship is in, in regards to this event that she was a featured speaker at that somehow I'm the jerk somehow I'm doing something wrong by questioning representative Buffalo representative Buffalo is a victim right of of this this evil blogger this mean blogger who's out to just get her I guess and yes certainly I am a critic representative Buffalo is a very very left-wing person is a democrat in the state legislature and that means that I'm going to be critical of her it's not a personal thing but my job is to call things like I see them. I'm a right of center guy. I'm a generally sort of libertarian, conservative guy. And she promotes politics that I don't necessarily agree with. So, yeah, I'm going to be critical. But you know what? I feel like politicians should have to even answer their critics when it's fair questions. Now, I'm not talking about questions like, you know, the, the proverbial, when have you stopped beating your wife type questions. I don't think lawmakers, you know, have any responsibility to respond to members of the public who are legitimately being, you know, harassing or members of the public who are, you know, legitimately answering, you know, just asking nonsense questions or asking the same question over and over again. I mean, there's only a certain amount of time that these lawmakers have, these politicians have, and, you know, they don't necessarily need to waste it responding to people who aren't being serious. But I, 
I'm, if, if, if I can just, you know, pat myself on the back here, I have two print columns in just about every daily newspaper in the state. I have this podcast, which is listened to by thousands of people. I have a blog that is read by thousands of people. I'm a pretty, dare I say, kind of an important person in North Dakota politics. I'm asking a fair question about Representative Buffalo's finances, and she's not answering. And that, to me, is the problem. And I, I think the response many in the public have had to me even asking the question is indicative of an even larger problem, which is that how often we on the right and the left are unwilling to hold our own side accountable. Now, in the last couple of weeks, I was critical of a group of Republican lawmakers on a, on a committee in the state house. You may remember this episode from a, uh, a previous uh, episode of this, this podcast, but they made some changes with regard to marital rape, right? And they, they were they were like setting marital rape aside in the law. Um, and this this was dealing with uh, you know uh, par, you know uh, parenting rights for people who may have created a child to rape, right? And so they they set out this carve out in the law where the courts couldn't terminate the parental rights of somebody who committed a rape within the confines of a marriage, and which to me was. I, you know, my reaction, my headline was, it's still rape, you idiots. That was me being critical of Republicans, because sometimes Republicans do stupid things and they need to be called out on it. Now, recently, also, I've been kind of on a on a tear about vaccines. Now, there's a significant portion of the right wing base and there's a significant portion of the left wing base, too, if we're at it. But there's a significant portion of the right wing base that is very, very anti vaccination. I don't have any problem taking those people on because I don't have any problem holding my own side to the extent that I belong to any side. I don't have any problem holding my own side accountable. But yet here we have an example where a politician has done something questionable done something for which reasonable questions might be asked, refusing to answer those reasonable questions and getting defended in that choice because the person asking the question is a critic. Now, to me, that just seems absolutely nuts. If the question's a fair question, then just answer the question. I don't have a problem with left-wing people asking Republicans questions, even if they're probably going to use the answers to be critical, even if I might think that they're going to be unfair in the way they treat those answers and whatever, you know, podcast or television show or radio show or blog post or newspaper column or whatever it is they're going to write or produce about it. Maybe I'm not going to agree with their criticism, but if the question's fair, answer the question. You know, it's, it's really hard to break through the the bubble of that, that politicians sort of create around themselves, right? It's it's hard to crack through that veneer that that the, that the politicians you know build around themselves for, for the public and i'm generally in favor of anybody who could crack through it and get any sort of candid information out of these people every week i host you know two of our three members of the federal delegation u.s senator kevin kramer and congressman kelly armstrong on this podcast to take your questions and uh, i'm sure those of you who have asked the senator and the congressman some real zingers some real tough questions under you know that I ask them. I don't I don't set them aside because they're tough questions. I ask the questions, even when they're tough ones, even when they're zingers, even when they're questions I think that are maybe a little questionable. I still ask them because I think that they should answer. And I think Representative Buffalo should answer. We should understand what her relationship is with Represent.us. We should understand uh, what, if anything, was paid for for her trip to Tennessee. It's a fair question. She's a public official. It was a fair question asked through her official channels, her official legislative email address, and the telephone number she listed in her legislative biography. So I hope Representative Buffalo answers me soon. I'm, you know, perhaps, uh, and I and I guess you know we'll we'll see what the nature of that financial. If if she does answer, we'll see what the nature of that financial relationship is. And I should add here, I don't have any problem with Representative Buffalo traveling to Tennessee for that event. I don't think that sort of thing should be restricted at all. Even though Measure One, uh, if if implemented, uh, when when fully implemented would seem to restrict that sort of thing. I I don't think it should be restricted. Um, I think it should be disclosed. I think it should be transparent, but not restricted. That's it for today's rant. North Dakota Insurance Commissioner John Godfrey joins me next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota, Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. 
With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. North Dakota Insurance Commissioner John Godfrey joins me now. John, have you been confirmed yet as the tallest po- uh, politician in America yet, or where, where are we at on that? This is this is what I really wanted to talk with you about. I had some <laughs> sub subterfuge about wanting to talk to you uh, about a new uh, a, a state reinsurance program, but I really wanted to talk to you about this being the tallest politician in America thing. Well, it's uh, we're working our way through it. Um, there's a there's a whole application <laughs> process that you got to go through with Guinness and. Uh, it's a long, long story short. Is it takes twelve weeks if you don't want to pay the money. If you want to pay about fifteen hundred bucks, you can get it done in a week. So uh, I think that's where they make their money. But now, I want to. I want to. Bu- through it. I want to bust you on something because you're using your you're using your height that you were measured at uh, when you played basketball. But a sometimes they don't tell the truth in those programs. And b have you <laughs> been have you have you been measured since? Because you might have shrunk, John. You are getting older. Oh, so I, I I did confirm that I was certainly taller than the six ten uh, the city councilman out of Brooklyn. Um, so yeah, I certainly confirmed before I went and ran to uh, to talk about this because that would have been embarrassing. Uh, the only issue that I found found is that there's a there may be a mayor in uh, Ohio that's like seven feet tall. Oh my goodness, he's also strong. So I don't know. I don't. We're, we just need to get it cleared up. And that's we got to uh, we got to get, get this support. settled. The 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 nation waits on bated breath. <laughs> Yeah. I wish I wish this was the most controversial thing we had going on in America right now. It'd be a better place, wouldn't it? If that's yeah, I, absolutely, I, I make that joke about the wonder. Some of the breaking news alerts our local media comes with up with sometimes. It's like breaking news. There's there's cattle loose on the highway or something. Like, I love I love living in North Dakota where the breaking news usually isn't well. At least sometimes isn't that bad. All right, let's yeah. talk about the state reinsurance program. Uh, your office announced last week that there's going to be a 31-day public comment period on the yep. reinsurance program for the individual health insurance market. Now, healthcare is, you know, always much on the minds of Americans because I'll tell you, we go to the doctor, it costs us a heck of a lot of the money, heck of a lot of money. Healthcare policy at the federal level has been a mess. Uh, most recently, our president says that, you know, he wanted to, to re, you know, take the issue up again. I guess maybe Senate Republicans aren't keen on that. I don't know where we're at on this, but so let's talk about a place where we can actually maybe make some policy progress. What's this reinsurance program? What does this mean for North Dakotans? So the the real short story of it is uh, we believe through this reinsurance program, we're going to see a, a 20% reduction on the individual market in, a, in the rates. Um, now, this this came by way of a study that we conducted last May through release the findings in September in front of the Interim uh, Healthcare Reform Review Committee, uh, drafted a bill for this legislative session. Um, that bill is, is currently still working its way through. It's uh, it's It's been approved by both houses. Uh, I need to get a, a, a minor concurrence from the House uh, to get it to the governor's desk and then get a governor's signature. But it's also, it it's, it's allows us to apply to the federal government to, to do this. And so we've got to seek a waiver through the ACA to be able to do this program, which um, is a whole other topic that we've got to go get a blessing from the federal government to do this, which is, is kind of crazy. Uh, but in order to meet the timelines that we need to meet to get it for the 2020 plan year, uh, we've, we've got to start taking some steps now. And, and one thing we can do is open it up for public comment. And that's what we announced last Friday that we were opening it up uh, and, and take that 30 day or 31 day window and allow the public to, to comment on it. We're going to have a meeting in, in Fargo. We're also going to have another meeting in, in Bismarck. I believe they're uh, in a couple weeks here. Uh, and so a chance for the public to come forward and, and talk about their, hopefully their support for the program or their dislike of the program. Uh, again, the, the, the comments will need to be focused on, uh, on the reinsurance program itself. And so uh, that's all available on our website, the the study we did, the draft application that we're working on. Uh, and so why, kind of while we're waiting that final legislative hurdle and, and getting that signature from the governor, uh, in order to meet, meet the timelines to get to the 2020 plan year, we had to do, we had to open up for public comment uh, sure. on last Friday in order to, to hit that. And so we're, we're, it is a little bit of a cart before the horse. We, we certainly understand that, that the, you know, the governor can still, choose to sign or choose to veto that that's certainly his within his purview uh but we're, we're hopeful for a, a positive recommendation out of out of legislature and then a, a sign uh, signature by the governor and we can move forward and if if that happens we needed to have the public comment period open 
who who is this for? I, I mean, this was for people who would who would seek insurance through the individual marketplace. I guess what the the healthcare yeah. exchange or whatever the nomenclature is we're using for that. Well, that that's the direct impact. Uh, you know, so we've got about twenty one thousand North Dakotans who actually have to go out and purchase their own health insurance. So they're they're on that individual market. They don't get it through their employer. They don't get it through the government. Uh, and, and within that marketplace, or sorry, we've got 42,000 uh, that do that. And then there's 21,000, so about half receive a subsidy from the federal government. So that's, that's that advanced premium tax credit. So they get they get their premium essentially capped based on their income. Uh, there's another 21,000 North Dakotans who, who don't receive any kind of assistance. And they've, they've taken year over year of that 20 plus percent increase on that marketplace and, and are really at the point where they can no longer afford health insurance. So we, we describe it as that those are farmers, those are ranchers, those are small business owners, the folks who don't have access to a large yeah. market. Uh, they're the ones who are out having to go out and buy that insurance and, and really, you know, taking it in the pocketbook. And, 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 you know, when you talk about things that are discussed around the kitchen table, it's, it's, it's this, it's how do I, how do we afford health insurance next year? And, and we have families who are making the decision and saying, well, thankfully we didn't have any issues last year. Maybe we forego it this year and, and take the risk. And that's, that's a pretty big risk to take. Uh, and, and we're hopeful that we can provide some relief on that marketplace through this reinsurance program uh, to do that. And, and it, it's important to note that this isn't, this isn't the silver bullet. Um, you know, we need, we need federal reform. We need reform out of Congress. I'm not anticipating anything uh, anytime soon. Uh, and, and depending on how the next, the next election goes, you know, that, that may very well depend on what kind of uh, health care reform we see or if we see any at all. And so in the short term, I, I believe we've got to do something to help those that population. That Again, those are farmers or ranchers, and, and we've got a high number of folks who who purchase health insurance but don't have access to that large market. And so uh, this, was, this was really our only option to provide a relief in that area because of the, the ACA is so restrictive on what you can and cannot do, and the things that you can and cannot ask a waiver for. Uh, and so you're seeing a number of states seek a, a reinsurance program um, somewhat similar to ours and somewhat similar to, to you know, other states. It's the same concept. Uh, and so really this is, this is our one true option to provide any relief to that marketplace. And in no way does it mean that we, uh, we support, um, you know, the rigid structure that comes out of, out of the ACA. We're still asking for that state, state reform and are allowing states more control. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got to do something, I believe, to yeah. provide uh, some relief to those individuals because, it's it's really crazy out there for those families that are that are again those farm families who you got two kids and all of a sudden you're paying yeah you know, thirty eight hundred dollars a month in in premium it's 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 ridiculous. Well, we talk about it all the time. I mean, we we like small businesses, yep. we like entrepreneurship. Well, the thing is, is if yep. you leave if you leave your job at a big company because you want to go take a flyer on some new business venture. Uh, well, you're going to have to pay for your own insurance, right? I mean, that's that's part yeah. of it. Like, you got to figure out how to cover yourself while you're doing that. And our individual market's a mess. And like you said, I mean, we'd all like to see reform, or not all of us, I guess, but a lot of us would like to see reform at the federal level. But until we, we've been talking about that for years, it doesn't seem yep. to be in the offing anytime soon. So until we get there, you know, we kind of have to play the hand we're dealt. So uh, tell me, how, how specifically does this reinsurance program – the cost is the big thing, right? I, I mean, I think okay. once once people have coverage, we're generally pretty satisfied with what they coverage. And of course, America has great actual care, like our doctors and stuff do a great job. Once once you're there, it's just it's just paying for it. So, yep. how how does how does this address cost? How, how how has this been the cost curve to to maybe help people out uh, be able to afford coverage where maybe they couldn't before? Yeah. So what we what we learned in our study is it, it provided some actual evidence to an anecdote that we've seen. Uh, year over year, is that there's a small number of individuals who are are medically complicated or have or have perhaps have a high claims cost year uh, that drive the rates for a lot of the other other market, right? So if you've got an outlier, you know that's a three million dollars in claims in one year, that's going to have an effect on everybody else because you've got to you've got to kind of bend that curve to, to even it out. What this program does is it takes um, you know from zero dollars in claims to a hundred thousand dollars in claims. It's, it's paid for like it always has been. It'll be the normal contract, whatever, whatever the agreement is. But once you get over that $100,000 mark, anything above $100,000 and up to a million, and then after a million, there's a federal program that can kick in. Um, so between that $100,000 and a million, uh, the reinsurance pool would pay 75% of those claims, and the, the insurance company would pay the other 25% of those claims. 
Now, this is it's an invisible reinsurance pool is what we're calling it because the consumer would know no different. They'd have their, their health insurance card. They'd go to the doctor like normal. Everything would be the same on a consumer. The only impact that they would see is that rate decrease. So the administration is, is done on the back end between the insurance company and and the insurance department okay. or the state on, on, on getting those claims covered. At, so at the end of the year, if I've got, you know, two or three people who have had, who have hit that, gone above that $100,000 mark, we would then go back and reverse reimburse them for the 75% of those claims. They would be on the hook for the 25%. And, and that's how you can, we're able to kind of take some of the peaks and valleys out of that, some of the spikes uh, out of those high claims cost individuals. And so, and what we found was that at the $100,000 mark, about 0.24% of North Dakotans ever, you know, would, would, would fall into that, that mark above a hundred thousand and a million. And so it's, it's a, it's a very small number of uh, North Dakotans who, who have those high claims cost years, uh, but due to the uncertainty and due to, um, you know, kind of the level of some of those claims, it, it is, it is, it drives the spike for, for the rest of us. And so yeah. if we can find a way to kind of even that out, we, we can see a pretty significant reduction on the rates. And so that's what this reinsurance program does. Now it's, it's funded. It, it's not free. Uh, and so you get, we'll, we'll see it, you know, we're predicting a 20% reduction. So the federal government should pay 20% less in premium tax credits. So they, they pass those savings on to the states and then we're, the state's responsible for the other portion of it, which is about $25 million in a calendar year. And, and so we're, we're, we're funding that through an assessment to the carriers. So they they'll be assessed per, per market share based on what they'd owe. And then the, the carrier is allowed to credit that back on their premium taxes. So there's a tax credit on the back end of that. So that should have a minimal impact. If uh, uh, should have no impact on the rest of the marketplace, the, the large group, the small group, the other the other areas where you get insurance. So we believe it's a fair way to use it. Those tax dollars that, that we, we pay on our premium taxes, um, you know, they're going to be used to hopefully impact the rest of the market. Because if you have a stable individual market, which this should help do, uh, then it should be able to stabilize the rest of the, the marketplace because the minute we lose our individual market. So if, if for whatever reason, our carriers say, you know what, this market's getting too sick. It's getting too complicated. We can't price it appropriately. We're just not going to offer it. My belief is the federal government will step in and say, well, you know what, we can provide a Medicare solution for those individuals. And the minute that happens, uh, there'll be no incentive for employers to provide that healthcare coverage because they'd essentially be paying for it twice. They'd be paying, you know, once for the Medicare for, for most option. And then once in their, in their own health insurance premiums to their employees. So, They'd say, we're not going to offer health coverage. You can go on the, and, and they go get it through the government. And then we're, 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 we've destroyed our private market and we're on, we're quickly steaming towards a single payer system, which is what I think we all would hope to avoid. Well, for sure. Now, just how, how does this impact like those of us who aren't, because like you said, this is a relatively small, although to be, to be sure, I mean, you're talking about there's a relatively small portion of the population that's going to hit those limits, but those are people who get yep. sick, right? That's like, yep. I got cancer, or I got in a car accident, or I had something terrible yep. befall me, and I had to use up a whole yep. bunch of health care. Hopefully, it'd be nice if none of us ever had to use that much health care, yeah. but unfortunately, yep. some of us do. So, so we're really helping those people out. Explain to me a little bit more how this affects the rest of the market. So those of us who are maybe getting insurance through our employer, uh, getting insurance through other means... How does this impact us? Does this, by, by stabilizing this marketplace, does this maybe take away some of that upward pressure on the premiums that the rest of us pay, those premium increases we don't look forward to every year? Absolutely. I think it, it, it certainly puts downward pressure on those rates. But it also, you know, we've seen when people who, let's say our, our prices continue to rise, we don't have a reinsurance program, and a good number of North Dakotans decide, you know what, I'm going to forego health insurance. It doesn't mean they stop seeking care. What it does mean is they, they, they either use their the ER as their primary care physician or they wait until something catastrophic happens. Uh, and then at that point, we're all paying for it through increased premiums because we've got to cover those uninsured folks. And so uh, it, it helps stabilize that, that marketplace and, again, keeps, I believe, keeps people insured, which is, I, I, think, I, I think everybody you know, wants health insurance. I don't believe there are people out there saying, you know what, I don't, I don't, I don't want this kind of coverage. It's just a matter of whether or not they can afford it. And, and so it, it helps Again, put that downward pressure on the rates and that and, and everybody in the large group market, your employer sponsored healthcare uh, area. But it also prevents um, you know, the the cost utilization uptake of of having uninsured folks going into the into the hospitals and seeking coverage and then having that either become bad debt care or charity care, which eventually gets passed along to everybody else. 
And, uh, and frankly, again, if, if we don't stabilize this marketplace, in my opinion, um, you know, we're, we're going to see a time when carriers simply will not write this coverage. Uh, I, I can't mandate folks to, I can't mandate carriers to, uh, to write what may be considered bad risk. Uh, yeah. and, and so we saw, we saw in 2018 that, you know, Blue Cross wrote, they're on the exchange for the whole state. Sanford was down to five counties and Medica, Medica dropped off. And so it's, it's not an unrealistic scenario where we, yeah. see, we see these companies making business decisions to say, we can't do this. Well, we don't want them to. And, and I so, mean, we, we don't want them to yeah. get into a position where they're doling out, where they're, they're operating unprofitably. Because you know what happens then is yep. they're going to they're gonna collapse or they're going to need a government yep. bailout or, or something else. I mean, we can't expect the That's insurance exactly company right. to, to just pretend as though, you know, we've created this untenable situation and then they just have to, you know, take it in the shorts you know yep. for not to be crude but i mean that's we can't expect that of them okay so this is a public comment period it looks like there's two scheduled events one is uh wednesday april 17th 10 to 12 p.m at the fargo dome uh mezzanine level meeting 202 in fargo the other one thursday april 18th in bismarck at the ram coda hotel and conference center and i'm sure they can find yep. all that information on uh nd.cov uh, the uh, north Dakota insurance uh, department website as well yep backslash the ndins and you know if folks who if you can't make it to those events and if they're they, you know, they're during the middle of the day where we all have jobs we always take comments uh via email you can you can email at info at nd dot or north dakota insurance department uh you can you can email us there there's also an email that's listed on our website to our deputy to my deputy commissioner who's taking the comments so um we're really really looking for any kind of public comments that people want to have to offer this is still a draft waiver, and so we're still working through some of the process. So if, if something does come up and we need to make a change, uh, there's still some ability to do that and to affect that. Uh, so we just encourage folks to be engaged. And, and frankly, I think you know this is this has been somewhat under the radar a little bit with the uh, with the reinsurance program. There's been a lot of other legislative issues that seem to have garnered a, a, some more attention. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're we're really targeting this at at the farmers, the ranchers, and the small business owners, yeah. the folks who go out and purchase their own health insurance. You know, this is a big deal for them, and, and I'd, I'd encourage a, folks to take a look at it. It's a consequential thing. That's why I wanted to have you on to talk about it. John, appreciate your time. Yep. Appreciate it, Rob. Thank you. That's it for today's podcast. If you would, if you're listening to this podcast on a platform that allows you to rate and review what you're listening to, if you would leave an honest rating and or an honest review, I would sure appreciate it. That sort of thing helps, uh, you know, all the algorithms in these podcasting apps helps uh, maybe recommend this podcast to other people who would enjoy listening to it. If you have any comments or feedback on the show, you can email those to Rob at sayanythingblog.com. I get emails from you folks regularly who might be having trouble, you know, finding the right place to listen to the podcast or whatever. I'm happy to help. Please, when in doubt, reach out. I'll do what I can to help you. Uh, follow me on social media. I'm at Rob Port on Twitter. If you search Facebook for Rob Port or Say Anything Blog, you can find us uh, on Facebook. And also, uh, Say Anything Blog has a Twitter account. So, you know, fo follow the uh, follow the blog on Twitter as well. And by the way, I should mention the reason why there's a blog. I, I sometimes put personal stuff up on my personal Facebook page and my personal Twitter account. So uh, if you just want the stuff from the blog, the podcast, the column, you know, follow the Say Anything blog accounts. If you want to see some funny uh, baseball anecdotes or pictures of my kids, we'll follow the personal stuff. And hey, if you follow, say hi, because I like it when people say hi. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again.